At this time, can I ask Ms. Kristina Zamorska to come up? Ms. Zamorska is, a, is the daughter and granddaughter of victims of World War II. <clears throat> she was born in Poland, educated in America. And she has degrees in central, excuse me, cultural anthropology, American and literary, literary studies. She uses both degrees to research the evolving, quote, history of the history of World War II and the consequences of the Cold War on the so-called West. Pani Zamorska. Dzień dobry. Good morning. Um, so this uh, lecture is uh, uh, partly personal uh, uh, because of uh, family history. Most of us in the room uh, are connected to the history through family and also professional. Um, I became interested in um, the American version of uh, uh, World War history and crimes uh, against Poland because of um, what we were hearing and still hear. So um, the focus of my lecture uh, is the role of the, the, the place of the concentration camps in the overall systemic oppression and exploitation and uh, extermination of Poles. Uh, but I changed the title since as I uh, reviewed the material and um, was preparing the lecture, I changed the title to what reflects the reality more accurately. German system of prisons and camps in the World War II economy and Stutthof as an example where my father uh, was interned. Um, my mother was a slave laborer as a child given to a German uh, farmer and Volksdeutsch and uh, my grandfather my father's father disappeared one day and never came back. So uh, there are personal stories, uh, which I'm sure many of you in the room identify. So, uh, with, so I'm providing a context of um, the oppression and the crimes by presenting the system of camps and prisons as an infrastructure you know, that was all interconnected and shockingly extensive in occupied Poland. So the, um, the, the conference, we're looking at uh, aspects of the war that were left out or are being misrepresented. Um, and Poland is very important in the story of World War II because that's where all of the major German crimes were committed in occupied Poland. That's where the military industrial complex was set up. That's where the camps and prisons uh, and, uh, were set up and even slave laborers from other countries were imported into Poland. Uh, Poland was made invisible um, to the allies and was turned into a slave labor industry for the Third Reich. And because Poland was an ally who got betrayed at the end of the war, the Cold War actually began in the middle of the war in, in 42, 43 with these negotiations that we just heard about. Um, Poland was left behind the Iron Curtain with all of that history and it never made it to the West. So my point, the main point of my paper is that uh, what's missing from the Western, so-called Western narrative of World War II is our German crimes committed in occupied Poland. And I wanna stress how important that is for the meaning and interpretation of what happened in Europe between, you know, until 1945 by drawing on literary studies. You know, when we tell a story um, or, um, a, a play, we use certain elements to analyze what's happening, action, right? We have characters and plot and uh, a conflict that needs to be resolved by the end of the story or play and, uh, and location. And location is uh, historical, physical, cultural, and all of that is missing from the narrative or World War II as we hear it in the West. So I'm arguing that until what happened in Poland as the setting, the location, is brought in into the Western narrative, the story will be incomplete, will be false, will be um, 
not representative of what happened, not only in Poland, but in the rest of Europe. Um, and the story that evolved, um, I want to stress, some of you may know this, but the Poland being left out, left behind the Iron Curtain with its history, um, the story in the West with the Nuremberg trials, what happened was that we got um, the prevailing narrative was German crimes against humanity. But then with the Eichmann trial in the beginning of the 1960s, that story ki kind of came to the forefront and stirred up certain topics and strands of the history. And the narrative changed to a very narrow narrative about German crimes as Nazis and predominantly the genocide of the G European Jews. And the rest of the larger context got left out of the narrative. So that's another part, uh, a part that we have to pay attention to. So um, I want to present um, the location, the persecution in Poland, which defines to, uh, certain aspects of the history that define the context, the setting that I'm referring to. I'm pushing the button, nothing's happening. It's happening, okay. So um, I'll come back to this image, but I just want to uh, show you this as uh, an example. So um, I'll come back to this at the end, but, I, but this is um, a symbol so, uh, uh, of the World War II narrative. Uh, this is Jan Karski's book. The copy on the right, uh, The Story of a Secret State, is the 1944 edition. If you look on the left, see how different the 2013 reissue is? And that's a commentary on what happened to World War II history from 1944 to 2013, the centennial of his birth. We talked about maps yesterday. This comes from an EPN publication, the Pol Poland before and after uh, uh, World War II. But we want to stress that none of this existed because there was no Poland. Right. Uh, when Germany came in and the Soviet Union came in, all of the infrastructures were destroyed. Poland's uh, cultural, political, um, uh, economic institution were either destroyed or taken over. So there was no Poland. We always have to say occupied Poland. And the tone of that occupation is summarized in Hans uh, Frank's comment in 1940, which is just a few months into the war. Uh, a, ger a German journalist asked him uh, how, how would he compare the protectorate of Moravia with Poland because he said uh, he wanted to compare, yes, he wanted to, to uh, get him to comment on p occupation of Poland. And, he's, and basically what Frank said, let me give you an example. By Let me give you an example. He said, if, uh, in the Czech Republic, every time seven people are shot, there are play cards announced and posted on kiosks and, and uh, public places. He said, if I had to post a play card every time seven poles were shot, there would be not enough trees in the forest to produce the paper for making the posters. Yes, we must be ruthless. And they were. And Hans Frank if, uh, published more than 30 volumes of journals of his uh, occupation, you know, his performance in Poland, which are accessible. So the German occupation of Poland um, was particular because of Germany and because of Poland. So there was, in my interpretation, there are several, several aspects that are integrated uh, that 
influenced uh, the persecution and the organization of that persecution in Poland. So as I mentioned, Polish state, Polish country was criminalized, it did not exist. Being Polish in Poland, uh, in occupied Poland was criminal. The second is racism, lawlessness, surveillance, policies of terror, and sustained daily violence in public and private sphere. You know family stories. You walked out of the house and you never knew if you'd come back. System of prisons and thousands of internment, slave labor, and concentration camps. I'll show you the list in a moment. The multi-ethnic population of Poland influenced how the occupation proceeded. Poland had 18% um, uh, of Poland's pre-war population was Ukrainian, 10% uh, Jewish eth Poles, um, and Lithuanian, German, and all of that, how ethnic uh, groups were manipulated and old scores played out, influenced the war. The other is important aspect is, of course, that um, Poland was the center of Jewish life in Poland, uh, in Europe. And the sixth is Poland's response to the occupation. Poland was not only the first to fight, but Poland was the first to resist. And the seventh is what we heard also in a previous lecture is um, the changing presence and role of the Soviet Union in that war. And when Poland was occupied, we tried to tell the West to get help very early on. There's research being done now that it happened as early as 1940. Uh, th there's a publication that I came across, I can give you a link to it. It's a book that's published by the Ministry of Information from London, I think in 1941. It has 600 pages. Um, and there were other, um, inform uh, other information was, um, conducted and passed on to the West without consequence, without avail. One of the um, early publications about what actually happened in Poland was published in 1946 in English here, uh, through the Ivo Institute. And if you look at the, this is page 26, uh, 22nd of what um, was bulletin number one of the German, um, Główna Komisja Badania Zbrodni Niemieckich w Polsce, and now it's IPN. Uh, so you can look at, according to this classification, there were 435 networks of camps in occupied Poland. So uh, uh, Gdańsk, for example, is listed here as one or two, but there were over 40 subcamps in, uh, in the Stutthof camp. One of the most extensive accounts, which is not used much, uh, is this publication, which came out in 1979, and it has almost 700 pages, and it's Obozy Hitlerowskie na Ziemiach Polskich. By now, we also had censorship in Poland after 49.50, which we went from Niemieckie to Hitlerowskie, to appease East Germany. Uh, so it, that's incorrect, just like using Nazi instead of Nazi Germany or Germany. Uh, so in this, I just want to share with you, um, this is an encyclopedic uh, listing of all the places of persecution in occupied Poland. It includes all, all varieties of prisons, uh, internment camps, transition camps, labor camps, uh, interrogation camps and prisons. And there are uh, all these pages and 5,877 entries. So we go from A to Z. And this is compiled by a team headed by uh, Professor Ch uh, Cheslav, excuse me, is that on here? I I'll find it in a second. But it's a team and the bibliography is amazing. Each, each uh, entry has a few centimeters, you know, of um, bibliography of sources, of archives. And at the end of this 
um, encyclopedic listing, there's, there are several pages, a dozen pages with two columns. If anyone wants to study this, those resources are super rich and documented. So um, this is a listing uh, of the types of camps and prisons, which is unbelievable. Um, the, they range from uh, court um, prisons to police prisons to labor camps run by the SS, labor camps run by the Gestapo, um, and POW camps. So hundreds of thousands of people went through these. And a lot of people died in them. So I, I, as one example, I looked closely at Wuch, which is uh, an internationally known um, city, the Manchester of Poland, with uh, a huge, uh, very multi-ethnic uh, population. So I, I looked closely at the listing for this one city, which is numbers from 2,577 in, in this listing of 5,877 entries. And uh, I, among these, this listing, this is what we have uh, in the city of Łódź, which is not counted in that, in, in that first um, category that I showed you of 535 systems of camps. This is in a city. Germans took over factories, schools, uh, all the places, places, buildings, and turned them into prisons, into interrogation centers. Uh, and this is what was located in one city. One POW camp for, I, I think this should have said uh, for Soviet prisoners, two POW camps for Poles, six transition camps for Poles, uh, and they sorted, this is where they sorted people for the general government, um, for the Third Reich camps. Resettlement camp, uh, get, one ghetto, out of that, one, one entry is for the ghetto. Police prison, you, you see the range. Someone will be speaking about reconsidering Jan Gross, and I just wanted to quote you something. In, 19, um, in 1977, the infamous uh, Jan Gross actually published a wonderful book, uh, a very important book on the German um, Polish society and the German occupation, and it's been out of print. And I just learned in the last few days that it's republished. Princeton University. Go out and buy it because it's an incredibly well-documented history of the bestiality, as he put it, in the German uh, in, Ger in German occupied Poland, and in original in the preface, Gross um, stresses that he's not covering the inevitably visible takeover by communists, and that. He also is not dealing with the Jewish Poles because that was a separate category as you, that was, I just showed you in, Wuj, in the Wuj example, and that there's a lot of documentation on that, so he is not dealing with that. So this is Stutthof camp, uh, one of the examples where uh, I visited the camp. It was one, um, mile, one kilometer from the shore, but, and I was told that prisoners never saw the Baltic coast. Um, there are many sub-camps. One was as far as uh, Toruń, a munitions factory. I can uh, provide the information uh, if anyone wants to see me afterwards in the sources, but I'm just gonna sum it up. But um, in, in Stutthof, um, they, the camp was also a private source of slave labor. Outside of the perimeter of the gates, German corporations would come and rent slave laborers for very cheap. So, uh, and many of them worked on private farms. So the whole economy of the German occupation was extensively supported by slave labor. I'll just show you what camp entry looks like. Um, this is a, a fellow um, camp mate of my father's who perished in four months. That was the average. People were exterminated through forced labor. And this is the entry for my father, 
which I found when I was I visited the camp a few uh, years ago. And a quick example of how war was very good for business. IG Farben industry, which still is doing well. Bayer is one of those firms. Look at the profits. It's not multiplied by percentages. It's a, these are humongous jumps. So um, I will end with a quote from um, Leave the much of this for later, just show you an example of the consequences of misinformation, of what happened, what happened to the uh, narrative. After the Eichmann trial, as I said, there was a, a tremendous paradigm shift. The narrative changed, and it, it became a very uh, strong American story. Um, we say needs on us business, but that's exactly what happened. Our history is being told uh, here. So this is, if you would read, um, look at the bold print. After the Eichmann trial revealed what was happening in the ghettos, Eli, the famous Elie Wiesel made a comment that is not only historically inaccurate, but it's, um, it's defamatory. Because he said, at the end, no wonder that all the, all the camps were built in Poland, as if Poles would collaborate and collaborate in the genocide. The camps were built for Poles to extract the labor, to exterminate people through forced labor. And the way some of this, I'll just show one slide with what happens in the academic world, uh, how this gets categorized, because knowledge is sorted, it's repeated, is framed, and that's very important for, for the historical narrative. And what happens in libraries, for example, could, because many of the people who are working in libraries are educated on this warped, incomplete, false history. So you end up getting categories, keywords, that have nothing to do with the reality. I think I'm, uh, look at The Zookeeper's Wife, the famous uh, book. I asked the author after I, I was looking for it in a library, in a bookstore, I went to World War II, it wasn't there. So I went to biography, it wasn't there. So I went to the desk and I was told it's under the Holocaust section. But she deliberately said, the zookeeper's wife, a war story. It's about the war against Poland. Thank you.